Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. Today we continue with our analysis of the microwave background and begin to dissect the results obtained by the WMAP satellite. I have completed an extensive review of this satellite in the past which is linked here below. There is clearly a lot to discuss relative to WMAP, but before we begin, let us return briefly to the Kobe Firis results. In this video, I had emphasized that the Kobe spectrum has never been obtained beyond Earth. I also explained the term monopole and highlighted that each frequency on the Firis result could act as a monopole or an image component with a uniform intensity. Now the central point is that even though cosmologists argue that the monopole exists at each sampled frequency in the microwave image of the sky, in reality they have never measured this component away from the Earth. They assume that the monopole is a central remnant of the Big Bang, but what they are doing is superimposing a result they have obtained in orbit around the Earth onto the celestial microwave sky. In fact, they have not yet eliminated the possibility that the monopole originates from the Earth itself. Keep this in mind as we move through the analysis of the results obtained by the WMAP and Planck satellites. Once again, the COBE satellite was placed in polar Earth orbit, and the COBE Firis results have never been replicated beyond the confines of our own planet. Remember, the COBE Firis horn was a broadband device with a smooth interior. As a result, this horn was unable to stop diffracted signals originating on our planet's surface from being acquired. As for WMAP, it offered 45 times the sensitivity and 33 times the angular resolution compared to the COBE satellite. Eventually, the project resulted in this image, known as an anisotropy map. Anisotropy maps are said to display tiny temperature variations in the sky, which are associated with remnants of the Big Bang. You can see in this image that signals vary from about minus 200 microkelvin, depicted in blue, to plus 200 microkelvin, depicted in red. The problem is to understand what these images of the sky actually represent, and secondly, if they have any scientific validity. The WMAP satellite acquired its anisotropy maps by simultaneously acquiring two signals from the sky using complementary and identical pairs of back-to-back -back Gregorian telescopes, separated in azimuth by 180 degrees and in total angle by 141 degrees. The primary mirrors on these telescopes measured 1.4 by 1.6 meters. The signals from the primary mirrors were directed towards identical reflectors prior to being projected onto a total of 20 horns, 10 for each side. You can see the arrangement of the primary mirrors, reflectors, and horns in this figure. In sharp contrast to the Kobe Furious horn, which had a smooth interior, all of the WMAP horns are narrow band devices with corrugated edges. Schematic representations of both designs are shown here. You can see the corrugated edges typical of a narrow band horn as used in the WMAP satellite. Such design ensure better beam patterns and prevent diffracted signals from being acquired. Using such corrugated horns, the WMAP satellite sampled five frequency bands in the microwave region of the electromagnetic spectrum at 23, 33, 41, 61, and 94 GHz. These regions are commonly known as the K, K, A, Q, V, and W bands. In this table, the associated bandwidths and central wavelengths are also displayed. The WMAP sampling frequencies are depicted on this figure, which represents a 2.7 Kelvin thermal spectrum previously established in part by the COBE satellite. The WMAP team chose these frequencies because they believe that these correspond to regions of the electromagnetic spectrum where contributions from the galactic foreground will be minimized. WMAP was equipped with differential pseudocorrelation radiometers, which function by constantly taking the difference between two regions of the sky. A depiction of the WMAP radiometers is displayed here. The design of these radiometers was impressive, and each arm had to faithfully duplicate both gain and phase changes. 
WMAP was launched in June 2001 and remained in operation until 2010. As previously mentioned, the instrument was placed at the second Lagrangian point. Now let us begin our analysis of the WMAP data. Here are five clean mole weed projections obtained at each of the WMAP sampling frequencies along with a temperature scale. Once again, dark blue corresponds to a temperature of minus 200 microkelvin, while dark red corresponds to plus 200 microkelvin. In this case, the negative temperatures reflect the fact that we are taking differences between two channels. Eventually, it is from such images that the anisotropy maps will be generated. Yet the first thing that you notice is that there is a powerful red band at the center of each of these images which was not present on the anisotropy map. This band represents the foreground contamination from the galaxy. Always remember that this red streak exists whenever you see the processed anisotropy maps. The WMAP team will try to argue that they can get rid of this galactic signal using data processing. I have strongly objected to the methods used and will cover this subject in detail in the next video. Now let us look at the moleweed projections for each channel one at a time with temperature scales. Once again, for the full WMAP resolution, this corresponds to plus or minus 200 microkelvin. At the highest frequency, W band, the galactic contamination does not seem to cover that much of the sky. But remember, this projection has already been cleaned with some data processing to help minimize the effect of the galaxy. Here is what the satellite actually saw prior to map cleaning. To make things clearer, I am displaying unclean data on the left and clean data on the right. For the two images at the bottom, the WMAP team degraded the pixel resolution and the scale changed to plus or minus 30 microkelvin. They also claim that they have subtracted out the contributions from the cosmic anisotropy. That in itself must be considered quite a feat given that those signals are forever entwined with those originating from the galaxy. In any case, at a coarse level, the map on the lower right at lower resolution generally corresponds to the map at the top with higher resolution. Notice that there is more galactic contribution in the map on the left then observed in the clean images. Now we move to V-band and again show the map prior to the cleaning. In this case, the galactic contribution of the sky is starting to get rather powerful. Next comes Q-band. Now the galaxy is covering most of the sky. Note that as one moves from higher to lower frequency, the galactic contamination on the unprocessed image becomes stronger and stronger. Surprisingly, the WMAP team does not display this type of data for the last two bands, namely K and KA. You can see the clean data for these two bands here. Obviously, the pre-clean data associated with these bands would essentially be made up of a red moleweed projection covering the entire sky. That is why the WMAP team does not present the pre-clean data for these two bands. That would help emphasize that the galactic signal is much too prominent to be removed, something that the WMAP team definitely wants to argue against. This serves to highlight the central problem with the WMAP results. It is physically impossible to remove the galactic foreground. Those who claim otherwise do so because they can claim any result whatsoever without ever being subjected to the need for verification. I have previously mentioned, again in this paper, that it is physically impossible to subtract a powerful overlying signal from a weak underlying signal without prior knowledge or ability to manipulate the sample at the source. Clearly, the astronomers cannot meet either of these two conditions. They do not have perfect knowledge, and they cannot tell when they remove a galactic signal if they are removing too much or too little at any given point. Think about it this way. They are essentially trying to remove just enough of the galaxy to image what is behind it. If you take a picture of your best friend using a camera, you cannot see if he is holding an apple or an orange behind his back. Yet that is exactly what the cosmologists are trying to claim. They can never properly subtract the galactic foreground. 
Indeed, the galactic foreground is a key problem in generating the anisotropy maps, not only because it is strong, but also because it is not stable. In fact, over time, the galaxy is well known to have slightly varying microwave emissive power. As a case in point, just have a look at this set of images, which displays maps at the five frequency channels for the first year versus the three year average. The difference maps are displayed on the far right. Everyone can note that a substantial residual remains in each image. You might try to claim that the scale is now smaller. However, I highlight that the three year average contains year one, and as such, one third of the intensity must subtract perfectly. This serves to mask the tremendous stability problem faced by the WMAP team. We will return to this issue later when we look at the anisotropy maps, but for now, remember this. The galactic foreground is present, and it cannot be removed. It remains unstable from year to year. Well, that is all for now. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the video to your local astronomy club, support me with a like, and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below, and I'll see you soon on our next video.